What is a micro-budget film? Budget film is a film that's made for an incredibly small amount of money, below ten thousand dollars. You know, I I think it's kind of subjective though. I sometimes I hear oh micro budget twenty five thousand dollars, but you know I've also seen filmmakers make a micro budget film for a couple thousand dollars. So what is a micro budget film? Now I know there's many different definitions, but for me, I will consider anything under one hundred thousand dollars as a micro budget film. Well, I would say that we did a no zero budget. budget. <laughs> we didn't do a micro budget. We did a zero budget, and literally, it was zero dollars because we did not rent any cameras. We we didn't. Uh, rent any locations. We uh, people who were in the film who were not local to Los Angeles actually flew in and stayed in a hotel on their own dime. I simply did not have the funds for it. I would have liked to have paid everyone to be in the movie, as well as put them up in hotels, as well as travel to various locations throughout the U.S. and as well as throughout the world. There was no funds for that, so this was a zero dollar budget. So a micro budget feature film to me is a film made under 50,000. Some people say more, some people say less, but to me 50 is a good number. A micro budget film is a film made with a very low budgets. For me, a micro budget film is something that's under $100,000. So basically it is a project where uh, you can do as much you can without spending too much money. And so that's why I consider it's a micro budget film. To me, micro budget is anything from zero to a few thousand dollars. I mean, if you have some equipment and you run out in the woods with your friends on the weekend, and you make a slasher movie. I mean, that's a micro budget, no budget, zero budget movie. Um, I'm usually working with several thousand dollars. Uh, to me, something that's $10,000 feels like low budget. I realize it's different for everybody, but uh, the people that I know on the projects I work on, um, several thousand is sort of micro budget. I think once you get to 10, 20, 30, that feels more like a low budget film in, in my world. I don't think there's any strict definition of a micro budget film, but I would say the resources are typically gathered through non-traditional funding. So it's people contributing their time and their energy and the money that they can scrape together. I would say maybe under 100,000 is something like a micro budget film, but you know, the lines blur. Some people might say 250, some people might say under 25 is a micro budget film. I like making micro budget films because they're creatively challenging. You can't just throw money at problems and expect them to go away. You have to actually solve them creatively. You will be competing in the cheer nationals. We're here to give you the tools it takes to win. There are no investors to please. It's not like you've mortgaged your future or taken on a lot of debt. So you have this freedom to experiment and take risks. And if it all goes wrong, you're probably going to get another opportunity to make another micro budget film. And I really think that's what this is all about now is creating these at bats for you to learn your craft and grow as an artist. Micro budget features really comes down to necessity. Um, there certainly is an energy there that I very much enjoy. There's an excitement there when you're with a good group of people and you're trying to, to all kind of achieve this common goal. That was professionally embarrassing. You should be ashamed. Uh, at the same time, it's also, again, necessity because a lot of times you don't have a lot of resources. You don't have a lot of time. I'm a big believer in the quality triangle. So if you take three points of a triangle and you can have good, fast, and cheap, you can pick any two of those three things. You cannot have all three. And if you're working on a micro budget, you need it to be cheap, but you want it to be ideally good, it's not gonna be fast. 
or if it has to be cheap and you need it to be fast, it's not gonna be good. So it's about trying to manage all of those resources and I love the challenge of that. Uh, for me, it's very important as a producer to be able to see a return of investment. At this point, when you do something, anything over thirty to $50,000, you probably will not be able to see a return on investment as quick as you wish. Just because we are currently in a world where distribution uh, buyers are a little bit more self-centered in the sense of they want to make a lot of money for themselves and pay less to their filmmakers. So at this point, uh, it's kind of for me, I just like to do that, to be able to see a quick return on investment. At the same time, having high quality production value, have good crew members and good uh, cast to be part of the movie. So micro budget film, films, if you if you know that, you know, or you're starting in the film industry, uh, or you know that uh, the topic in the movie or, or the movie itself uh, is not a, um, maybe it's a small targeted audience uh, uh, you're making the film for. A uh, micro budget film can be uh, the perfect uh, type of film, uh, way to make your film. So in order to be sure uh, to cover the expenses. Mine was a passion project. It evolved. It was nothing I ever knew I would ever do in my entire life. I had no thought ever. I just turned 60, so there you go. So it was very late in life I decided, oh, I'm gonna do a film. Well, you know, <laughs> it was a huge undertaking and I'm glad I did it, but I'm not so sure I'd do another one. I started making micro-budget features way back in the 90s on this gigantic VHS camera. Because this gigantic VHS camera is all I had, and I've always believed you do the best you can with what you have. So I started just making stuff on VHS, I moved up to Mini DV, eventually moved up to DLSR and HD and shooting on SD cards, etc. But um, I was always, you know, micro-budget, low-budget, whatever I could do with whatever I had at the time. And so I liked it. I liked the control you have over micro budget stuff. It's, it's mostly you making those decisions. And so I like being able to create the movies that I want to, and you can really do that at a micro budget level. I'm not house sitting in a haunted house. So we make micro budget feature films because we find that it's easier than waiting for finance to come through. It's easier than to um, just go out and make the film rather than waiting for someone to give you money to make it. We've always had the indie approach since we've been making films together in 2009. So we just don't see the point of waiting around for money to just fall from the sky, you know, and there's a lot of work to actually invest, get investors on board. And there's a lot of, um, promises you have to make to other people. So we like to keep the control and we also just want to go out and make films the old school way. Micro budget features are really fun to make because you have the opportunity to do literally anything that you want. Uh, and even though the budget seems like a real kind of constraint, it gives you the opportunity to try different things and to try to do a lot of problem solving to get the best product for a small amount of money. And there's something about the character of the film that's really fun to watch. I really enjoy watching how people put together movies without any kind of constraints um, and making the best of their resources. Yeah, we make money, you know? Um, when I first started this, I'm very new to it and I went a very non-conventional way into filmmaking. I never went to film school. I didn't do any of that um, stuff at all. I just kind of started making our, our own film and it all progressed from there. So. As I've been learning, I see quite a lot of filmmakers really struggle with making money. They're able to raise a lot of money for their projects, but as far as the projects being profitable, that's extremely difficult. The large majority, gosh, in percentages, it's gotta be 99 plus percent of the projects are not profitable. I've made a little bit of money off of my movies, but not enough to call it a profitable venture. But I'm not making these films to make money. Unfortunately, it's not. That's not who I am. It's not what. It's not that. It's not who I am. It's that's my dream. That's what I want to do. However, I have not gotten to that place yet. It is a place that I am slowly grinding towards, and you know, it's only been made harder by the whole industry not only upturning but like constantly evolving. The the goalposts are constantly shifting, and every time. 
you know, I put my head down to do the work to get to where I think the goalpost is, the goalpost has moved another 150 feet, another 250 feet. And, you know, I find myself sort of, you know, getting a little demoralized and, you know, picking up all my gear and like, you know, huffing it to the next goalpost. And then when I get there, it's like, oh, it's all the way out there now. And I just keep running. I keep running because I'm never going to stop running. I, I will never give up. Why? Because this is who I am. This is what I do. I like who I am when I'm doing this stuff. And I will never stop until I get to a place where I could potentially be doing this full time instead of having a lifeline job or a day job. I would say yes. Um, started with the second feature film, The Rapture, that we actually get out there uh, back in 2007. We actually been seeing money coming in. They actually, um, in the sense where I actually made enough money to break even, and then all the feature films since then has been doing well. Except for the two that I help executive produce, they haven't. They haven't made lots of money, but they one of them did made about, I think it was about ten thousand dollars. The other one I'm not sure at this point. Do I make money with my movies? Yes. Do I make a living with my movies? Not necessarily. I make some money here. I make some money there. I work various jobs, so it's all part of the puzzle. Oh, what was that? Oh, that's my new move. I call it the roller coaster. I've never lost money on a film, but I'm certainly not getting rich off of them either. They have led to other production opportunities like directing commercials, music videos, corporate marketing communications. I have made money, I have lost money, and kind of everything in, in between. The I've always looked at them as as our, you know, micro budget projects as an investment in the future. Not necessarily strictly from a monetary standpoint, but you know, we've written and produced a lot of short films and through the process set up an infrastructure so that when we wanted to do the web series or do a feature or whatever, we already have a strong team that we know we can rely on so that when real money is involved, we know that the ball's not gonna be dropped. So I look at it as you definitely get back what you put into it. Um, that doesn't always necessarily mean that you're gonna turn a financial profit. Making money on micro-budget films is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, I think even a few years ago, there were a lot of outlets and a lot of ways that you could make money. Now those streams have really started to dry up. So you have to be very, very resourceful and be constantly dynamically changing your method for uh, reaching the audience and for monetizing your films. And people are doing all kinds of different things. Um, they're making more money on merch or they're making money on DVDs that they sell at conventions. But the typical kind of just streaming platform approach, you know, hoping you, you put it out there and you're gonna make money on it, is feeling a little bit dead these days. All right, so I had my film on, I had a bunch of my films on Amazon Prime. Uh, until Amazon decided it was closing up shop on all the little indie micro-budget films. So all of my films have been pulled from Amazon Prime and that's where I was making the most amount of money. Um, I currently have all of my films on Vimeo On Demand, but the problem is Vimeo On Demand is the probably the most friendly platform towards filmmakers in terms of like, you know, if you wanna be an autonomous distributor of your films on an on-demand, using an on-demand platform, Vimeo is the answer, but the problem is it's not intuitive for audiences. Audiences don't like Vimeo, so that's the big disconnect. You know, Vimeo gives the filmmaker 90% of the revenue uh, which is the best deal out there. You're not going to get find a better deal. If you are someone with a name, if you have a cult of personality, if you have any kind of following, Vimeo is totally going to be your friend, and it's going to totally allow you to make you know a reasonable amount of money because you're going to be able to use your name and your clout to drive traffic, drive your audience traffic to that platform, whether it's intuitive for them or not, especially the diehards because they're gonna go wherever you're putting your stuff. That's not the case if you're trying to find organic, you know, natural impressions or whatever you wanna call it. I have a website, skullfaceastronaut.com. It's kind of the hub for everything. I get DVDs made and I sell them off my website. I also have my own Vimeo channel, so I do rentals and downloads from 
my Vimeo channel. I have a deal with some other distributors to sell physical copies, DVD and Blu-ray of some of my titles. I have a deal with some other distributors to do video on demand for some of my titles. You could tattoo bitch on your forehead. Whatever floats your boat, man. I have a deal with a few Roku channels that have some of my titles. I've also done things like box sets. I did a box set myself and I'm working on a deal for another box set that another distributor is going to put out on Blu-ray. I also have done uh, deals with some small boutique VHS distributors that do these sort of collector item, short run, big box clamshell VHS things. It's a cool collector item. It's uh, attractive to physical media collectors and it's one more way to get my movie out there. And, and even just getting the publicity from, hey, here's this, a v you know, people are like, VHS? Here's a movie I made just a few years ago on VHS, right? It's a special edition. Uh, that gets people's attention. Even if they're not going to buy it, that might get attention for the movie. They might rent it on Vimeo or they might buy a DVD from me or watch it online on some other service. So um, I try to get my movies out in a variety of ways. But the key is I'm usually in control of them. I do have uh, some stuff on Amazon and through Film Hub, and that's a great thing to do too. That's kind of out of your hands, you know, you put it up there and it does whatever it does. The other things I'm uh, often dealing direct to consumer, and that's nice because again, I build my mailing list or my emailing list and uh, sort of go towards that big chunk of fans that you want to try to have. I've always been a firm believer in self-distribution. I like taking control of my own destiny. I've been self-distributing my film since 2009. We sold at film festivals, conventions, online, you name it. Out of a trunk in a parking lot, we did it. I think it's important to look at all the different platforms available to you. Certain films are going to do better on certain platforms. For me, Amazon and iTunes have been the best. How do I distribute my movies? It's a good question. I'm on my eighth feature film now, and for my first three films, I used a traditional distributor, and I've yet to see any royalties or checks or anything like that from those movies. My two, my two films after those, I self-distributed, and I used a marketplace aggregator called Film Hub, and I'm starting to see uh, analytics and royalties come in for those, so I'm pretty happy with that. And then the film that I released last year that just came out, uh, I did kind of like a split deal where I shot the film for a distribution company and they're the ones who put it out. The great thing about the current landscape now is I first moved out to LA in 2002 and it's an entirely different world now compared to what it was then. There was very much a barrier of entry because A, you probably couldn't afford the equipment that you would need to get something shot. And then if you could, you wouldn't have anywhere with which to show it. So nowadays it's an embarrassment of riches in the sense that through just YouTube and just through the, the internet in general, you have a platform. One way or another, you will find a platform where you can release whatever it is, the things that you are making. Now the problem is there's so much content that it's really hard to break through the noise in order to actually get an audience to see the stuff that you do. But that's a much better problem to have than not being able to make or release your stuff to begin with. Um, for me, uh, I've used Vimeo before, most recently with the, the web series Job Guys. We released that on Amazon Prime. And there's you know youtube has has been reliable in the past again it always provides there's always platforms whether those platforms will work for you or provide you the things that you need them to provide um you know there's a there's a lot of variables that go into that so when we shot our 24 hour feature film friends foes and fireworks we were watching our peers go to khan film festival we were watching everybody go to afm and sell their film we were, and we were told that you know we were still coming fresh off daughter from 2016 and we were like oh everyone's going to afm to sell their films one day we'll go there too and then we had a feature film that we shot in 24 hours, Friends, Foes and Fireworks. And we were previously at Khan with Daughter with a short film. And we saw there was more opportunities to sell a feature film. And it was more, more of a networking experience and to meet more people through a feature film. So when we had Friends, Foes and Fireworks, we decided to go off to LA and look for a distributor at AFM. 
And yeah, it wasn't a fun experience going to sell a film. Um, yeah, we packed our lunch like true easy filmmakers and we walked in there saying we've got this film. We tried to, we pitched it um, to a few different distributors and some of them said they were interested, but only one of them followed through and that was Turnkey. Um, Turnkey Productions, I think. Turnkey called, Films. Turnkey Films, yeah. They put it on Amazon and it kind of just sat there not doing much. But they did get us a DVD deal uh, with a company called Dreamscape and Dreamscape distributed the film throughout Best Buy and various stores in North America. So that was a nice bonus that we weren't expecting. Uh, but getting back to the original question um, about how we distribute our films, Friends, Foes and Fireworks was again an experiment for us when we didn't know, we thought like, as I said, our peers were doing it. So we went to the market and sold our film. We thought, yay, we've sold our film. Now we're going to make lots of money. And it wasn't like that. We're like, we thought it was going to see our film. This is going to be fantastic. But it wasn't actually like that. And we found there were other ways to do it. So now we put our films up on Film Hub because we've been listening to a lot of um, Jason Horden and um, Alex Ferrari talking about other ways to make money from your films. And we found that going the traditional route didn't work for us. It didn't help our films at all. And we find that hybrid distribution works better for us, putting it through our website, selling mm -hmm. through our website, selling, giving it to Film Hub. In terms of distribution, we've taken different approaches to each of our films. Some of them we've sold kind of all the rights to a single distributor to deal with it domestically and worldwide. Some we've worked with more like a sales agent to sell kind of piecemeal rights to you know domestic and then foreign or different media rights. Uh, we've also done our own distribution and people call it self-distribution, but I kind of think that that's a misnomer because really what you do with self-distribution is that you find ways to make little tiny license deals. So in other words, you're not really selling it out of the back of your car or something like that, which is what self-distribution sounds like. You're saying, oh, I can sell the VHS rights to this company. I can sell the Blu-ray rights to this company. I can put it on my own website and sell it directly to fans. Um, so I think you know we're becoming, we have to become more and more like the sales agent, the distributor, uh, the promoter, all of these kind of play all these kind of roles in the distribution of our films. You know what's funny? Since Amazon Prime has pulled all of my films and I really feel like I'm destined to be a self distributor if I'm going to continue to do this, I'm starting to entertain the idea of putting up my films on YouTube um, since my account is monetized. Since I'm making a lot of money, uh, I'm making a lot more money than I was on, on Amazon Prime, frankly, on YouTube. I have to say I've only worked with a few distributors over the years, and I've been very lucky that I, I, I've had a good experience with them. The bad experiences I know of are projects I was associated with that I shot or co-produced or whatever, where someone bought a movie then they sub-licensed it to someone else and that deal went bad and the uh, bad company kept the master suddenly there's no master for that movie anymore um, or a company continues distributing something after the contracts out and again it was one of those like we sold it to this guy he licenses it to these people they're you know they've extended it and they they shouldn't have and so i've been lucky it hasn't been me directly but i i have seen that type of thing happen with other filmmakers um, and the, for projects I've been associated with and it's it's always difficult and the best thing you can do is just make sure you read the contract and then just make them stick to it. Number like, eight, right? Yeah, have you had bad experiences with distributors explained? You don't have to name names. No, I didn't. I haven't. No, we haven't had any trouble. But with that's them. wait. But the reason is here's the reason I watched mm. Jason your channel on uh, YouTube. I watched Alex Ferreira's channel on YouTube. I read a ton because I was not going to just give my film away and say to a distributor, please pay me when you can. No, that was not going to be me. <laughs> I was going to learn everything as much as I could because I didn't want to be taken advantage of. And I knew I had two strikes against me. No, I had three. One, I had no experience. Two, I'm a woman. And three, I'm an old woman. 
So with those three strikes against me, I knew that I was gonna be taken advantage of unless I learned a thing or two, and that's what I did. And so that's why we did not have bad experiences with distributors. So I've had a few multiple uh, bad experiences with traditional distribution. Uh, my first three films, they got put out, you know, whether it's DVD or streaming or anything like that. But I received no back end pay, no royalty checks, nothing of any monetary value. Um, after that, I tried self-distributing through Distriber and that was a big fiasco. If you don't know who Distriber is, you can do a Google search. Uh, they swindled millions and millions of dollars out of filmmakers. And now going through Film Hub, I'm pretty happy with seeing the analytics and just the royalties and everything like that. So I do plan to use self-distribution. I had a terrible experience with a distributor who handled all the VOD stuff for my film. Um, there was no communication with the distributor. Uh, they did not show me any numbers or metrics or anything. Um, and they lied. The distributor lied. They said they were going to do X, Y, Z, one, two, three, and they didn't. And they didn't uh, communicate to me why they didn't. Uh, and eventually I was able to get my film Hold. And so now I'm in control of it, which brings me back to your previous question about, you know, uh, dis distribution. You know, I'm kind of thinking I'm a big fan of punk rock bands. And what punk rock bands would do is they would form their own record labels and they would press up their own seven inches. They would wait until they had enough money um, to basically be, you know, listen, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, and self-fund your own film, why not continue with self-distribution? And so the way I'm looking at it is if I'm going to sell my films, perhaps I need to treat them, perhaps I need to treat them like it's a punk rock seven inch, you know, like press up a very limited number. And then when it goes out of print, it goes out of print and then make another film. I think every filmmaker has had a poor experience with a distributor. I think it just goes as part of the territory. It's part of growing up as a filmmaker. Now with Turkey, we still have a 50-50 you know, love-hate relationship with them. Um, they didn't do much with the film apart from put it down on Amazon and just leave it. So we were expecting more. Like I said in the previous question, they did get us a deal with Dreamscape, a DVD deal. So we signed them to like um, do DVD distribution. And that was for Friends, Friends them, and Flowers. That was for Friends, Friends and Flowers. Films. So we were excited about that at the time, but then one to two years passed and we found out that Dreamscape had actually put the film up on Film Hub and that was never part of the original contract with them. Turnkey to believe it was only for DVD, but then they went and put it on to Film Hub to distribute it, you know, by various streaming platforms. And, you know, we were pretty upset when we learned this and we ended up breaking we ended up getting out of the contract with turnkey and it took a lot of back and forth arguments via email <laughs> it was hard enough to get an email from them about how much money our film was making let alone getting them to yeah that, that's the also like a big problem well, they'll never give us any reports it will take like six months of hassling to get reports on how friends person fireworks are doing so when we wanted to like um get out of the contract with them like we built a clause that if the film didn't return 10,000 in the first 18 months of the contract, we had it out. But even getting out of that contract took a lot of back and forth arguing. We had a lawyer involved, giving us advice. And eventually we did get out of the contract and got the rights back to Friends Person Fireworks. As well as daughter as well. We had daughter and on there daughter well. also, they had daughter. So they agreed to part with daughter at the same time. But, at, but they the deal that I already had in place with Dreamscape, that deal continues to this day. They told us they couldn't end that deal. So they still pay us, which was a surprise. Yeah, we didn't expect that. We thought, great, now they're just going to have all the rights to our DVDs and just going to be selling it and not give us it, any money. It but was a big surprise. <laughs> we got an email. At the start of this year, we got an email from Turkey giving us money from you know, Dreamscape, what the film was bringing in from DVD. And like, we weren't expecting that at all. We thought we'd never hear from that again. So like I said, it's a love-hate relationship with distributors. So I think just about everybody who has worked with a number of distributors will say that they've had bad experiences with distributors. 
Part of it is that it's hard to know what your expectation should be. I remember when we were releasing our first film, I thought we were gonna make a ton of money. And so it seemed like things were going badly when we didn't get paid as much as I had hoped. But I think really we just didn't understand what the field was like. And so a lot of people will have complaints about distributors just because they didn't really understand what was gonna happen. In other cases with some of our films, um, we've signed deals where there were a lot of promises made in terms of what outlets we would have access to, you know, what stores we would get into, what kind of sites we would get on. And so it looked like a great opportunity to make a lot of money, but then those things don't really come through. Or the foreign sales deals that, that do come through aren't really for the amount of money that you were promised. So in those kind of cases, sometimes we don't get paid at all, which is, I would, I would call a bad deal with a distributor. The current streaming landscape it's a pretty tough one to pinpoint because there's a lot of different platforms. But I'll, I would say the big ones, you know, the really big ones where most people are watching, they're not independent filmmaker friendly. So it's really, really tough to get on there to get in front of their faces and stuff like that. Even the ones that do don't pay a lot. So hopefully things change in the future where the pay is fair, it's more open and independent filmmakers can make a living at this. The, the thing about success in this arena, it's not A to Z, it's not A to T, it's not A to M. You go from A to B, from B to C, from C to D, from D to E, you know? And it feels like it takes forever, but when you look back, you know, and you see things more in the big picture, you go, oh, I see the alphabet is forming here. Yeah, 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 this makes sense. I think it seems to be contracting again. I think the recent Amazon bloodbath of indies uh, just shows that it's sort of shrinking. There's gonna be less places, uh, less of the bigger places for independent film. More and more large corporations are coming out with their own streaming service, so which was just for their stuff. So again, that might squeeze out independent filmmakers. I think there's gonna be other venues other avenues that pop up or there might be ways to get in on some of that stuff it, it all it all ebbs and flows all the time um, but I, I do think it's kind of contracting right now and things might be bleak for a little while so yeah, the streaming landscape i think it is what it is it's right here right now it's not just the future it is what we have and what we have to deal with as filmmakers i really do not like how much we get paid for streaming, I think Netflix has trained the generation of people to expect film for next to nothing. And economically, it doesn't actually make sense to me. You have this product that is worth thousands of thousands to actually make, and then you, know, you sell it for one cent per hour on Amazon. Apparently that's all it's worth. So I don't like that aspect of streaming. But at the same time, your content is readily accessible now to most people in the world. So you can get your films out there where before, you know, it was locked up by distributors and it was, you know, it was difficult to even make a film, let alone get it out there. Now it's easy to make a film, but getting it out there and actually getting attention to your film is the challenge that you're facing. I think another problem that you face besides the lack of respect for people who, um, for the filmmaker, because there's a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, I think we've moved more with the generation now is more um, wanting things for free. So it's easier for people to just go onto Netflix and pay $10 to um, subscribe to that platform and watch a thousand films a month if they want to can sit there and watch all day. But then when you say to them, could you please um, share this link and buy my film? It's $3.99 on Vimeo on demand. They're like, oh, I have to pay for it. And I find that that's, there's a lot of disrespect um, for the filmmakers and there's a lot, a lot of misunderstanding in the audience because um, they think that, you know, it's still doing, you know, it's still great that they're watching supporting the arts by using Netflix. But what they don't know behind the scenes is that filmmakers are not getting paid every time you watch the film using Netflix or a platform like that. So I think there needs to be more education around the way people buy films because um, that happened to me also. I was We would try Gum Road at one stage and I was putting our film on Gumroad and saying, everybody, you know, our film's on Gumroad, now check it out, a new platform. And then I had my actors under it going, oh, I'm gonna like promote it on Amazon because that's what my um, network knows, that's what my friends know, they don't trust Gumroad. And I'm just like, why are you counteracting 
my my post like that's like you're sending people to amazon when i'm sending them to gum road they just don't understand that you know this is more viable for us do it this way so i think we are losing a little bit of respect for filmmakers and for the arts and it's a shame because in covid they had the whole thing of support the art support the arts you know support the artists because you know artists need to get paid and but I don't think a lot of positive has come from it because we're still looking for the cheaper options and we're not supporting directly. But I think that will change. I think when um, a few platforms shift towards supporting the filmmaker, and it's not just with films, it's with art as well. Like a lot of people will go to a mass produced company before they'll go to a local artist, which is a little bit sad, but I think that's the way that um, it's moving. I think we just need to shift attitudes the challenging thing about the current streaming distribution landscape is that it is constantly changing. So as soon as we feel like we've got something locked down, like we look at it and we say, oh, because of the way Amazon is structured, we can make this amount of money so we can afford to put this amount into our films, it'll change. The royalties will change. The availability will change. So it's just really difficult to know what anything will be like six months or a year from now. Um, and it's difficult to know what sites will be used by people. There's constant explosion and growth of new sites, and then they merge with others or they disappear. And the landscape really changes so rapidly that it's just, you just gotta make the best thing you can and hope that you hit it at the right time. He's an artist, honey. We're all weirdos. Physical media is a big part of my releases. I think horror fans and be horror fans in general uh, often are big physical media collectors. I get my own DVDs made, I make them, uh, get them authored and I get them duplicated at a, at a place just in the next town over. I sell those off my website. I also have a license for a couple people to make uh, DVDs and Blu-rays from some of my titles. Uh, I work with companies that are doing these niche VHS releases. Uh, these are like collector item, limited run VHS releases of stuff. Uh, it's again, a collector type of market. I think physical can go beyond even the movie. I get t-shirts made uh, and even like this glow-in-the-dark baseball cap, you know. It's, it's physical stuff that people like. I make artwork sometimes. There's all kinds of things you can do, uh, action figures, little, you know, 3D printed things, all kinds of stuff you can do that is another tactile physical thing associated with your movie that people that really dig it or dig your stuff might be interested in getting. And I, also, I do also believe that physical media can do a lot of play. When we have the Immortal Kombat release last September 2020, we actually have it on digital platforms and on DVD for sale. And I do know a lot of people like to buy DVDs or, or so they have a copy, so they can say that they have actually a physical copy of the movie. So that's something that I would think still, I still think that for within the five years from now, it still can be valid and important to have. Maybe after five years, that can, be, oh, it can become digital. I personally used to buy a lot of Blu-rays and DVDs movies, but now everything is all digital. I don't really depend on physical media. I have a low number printed because as a fan of physical media, I, I know and appreciate um, just the difference between it and streaming. And I know there's other people like that. So it's, it's a small part, but it's not a big base. Um, it's the, the world's just changing. We've been doing less and less physical media with each release, uh, but what we found is that there are niche audiences who are really interested in still collecting physical media. So for our last couple of films, we've had the, the, the great luck of working with this company called Horror Pack, and they have put out our movies on Blu-ray, um, and the way that they do that is they have subscribers who pay for a monthly uh, mailing of four Blu-rays, and one of those is a special edition only released in that pack. And so we've been lucky to be part of that pack. And the reason is because we could not afford to release Blu-rays. We wouldn't be able to sell enough of them on our own without something like that. And I think that's a really good model. Not, not only Horror Pack, but other companies who are doing that niche model where they know there's a specific audience who collect Blu-rays or collect VHS or collect DVDs and will be continuing to put out media with that target market in mind. As an individual creator, it's harder for us to really reach those people directly. So, you know, we can do print on demand, Blu-rays and DVDs, but um, it's difficult to do really a traditional full run of physical media. We market right now through social media and we pay for ads on things like Facebook and Instagram. Done a little bit of marketing with like making postcards. Some of our uh, film subjects have done their own marketing 
And that seems to be the most successful when, when people are、uh, kind of speaking to their following and they're willing to kind of do that on a routine basis, not just once. They kind of put their, their email out one time. That, that's helpful. It's better than nothing. But the ones that are emailing like weekly or daily or, or whatever it is they're doing on a constant basis, that really gets the message out there and that's gotten some of our films a lot more seen. The other thing is if you can tap into a subject matter that just has a following of really passionate people who are generous and who will share your movie without knowing you just because they are passionate about the subject that you're talking about. I do not use a PR firm because I don't have any money. Everything I do to promote my film, I try to do without spending money. When it comes to PR for films, or when it comes to promoting films, it's really good to foster relationships with critics and blog writers and film reviewers and such. And、um, if you, if you, you know, get in touch with these people and foster a relationship that's not based on quid pro pro, you can then, you know, go to them and be like, here's my film. Would you consider, you know, uh, uh, taking a look and appraising it?、Um, because at the end of the day, the, the goal is how can I create a Google trail? That's what I think of it. It's a Google trail. So that when people search for my film, a whole slew of results. Shows up if you know I were to go to a distributor and be like, Hey, you're interested in my movie, and then they were to you know Google my film, they would be able to see the trail, they would be able to, to see that you know I've accomplished things.、Um, so for me, and that's all about just reaching out through the internet and being like, Hey, I got a movie, I'd like to come on your podcast. Hey,、um, I would, I, would I would love, you know, would you consider、uh, watching and reviewing my film for your website, your blog? There's a million different ways. It's networking. Again, zero budget. So while I would have liked to have hired a PR firm, I did not have, I don't know, the five grand one needs. <laughs> if that's probably not enough money, I have a feeling. But anyway, so it was all by myself. Yeah, I thought I was going to be done in a year. I was so naive. Okay, that's a good thing. So, the first thing I did was back in February 2015, I immediately put up a Facebook page and I got that going. And there was already a community on Facebook. So, I didn't have to go and now look for that、mm -hmm. community. I was only responding to what the community was already telling me. And so,、um, I just started putting the word out because there were a bunch of private、uh, Facebook groups specifically. For women with gray and silver hair, and I just started putting the word out. And then、um, I started having women come to me who were very interested in what I was doing, and then they started slowly sharing some of my posts. And then over time,、um, I, I guess I got onto Instagram at some point, and I started seeing a direct correlation. The more I posted on social media, The more it gave me back,、mm -hmm. whether it was monetarily kind of down the road, which I see to this day. If I post a movie review, and I want to tell you, I have so many, I cannot keep up with them. I, I, they're like coming from all directions. Not a bad thing. Not a bad problem. But、um, when I post legitimate movie reviews, that all I do is copy and paste. From some comment, comment from one of the posts I've made previous, it's legitimate and it was unsolicited. People are just saying, ladies, how much they love the film. When I post that, we immediately start making people will go to the website and either pay through PayPal or pay through Stripe and watch the film streaming. Promotion for your film really starts in the pre production phase, utilizing social media. Posting videos, pictures, behind the scenes stuff. And nowadays, it can't just be about you. You've got to bring value to your audience because nobody really cares. I mean, everybody's got their own thing, right? So I would highly recommend creating videos that describe how you accomplished a particular special effect or maybe a special effects makeup tutorial. 
or something that contributes to the community. So it's not just look at me, look at me, look at me, because nobody cares anymore. At the end of the day, we're all slaves to the algorithm. So you really need to focus on making content that has a defined audience and gives them exactly what they're searching for. And I know you're gonna say, oh, that's selling out. I wanna do what I wanna do. And I think that's great. But if nobody's buying your films, it's gonna be really hard to make another one. For marketing my films, I've used a PR firm for two of the films that I self-distributed. I was pretty happy with them. They're called October Coast. I would say they're probably the best PR firm for independent filmmakers. Um, that's probably the only time I've tried marketing um, because for my first three films, distributors, they charge a marketing fee. And I always thought that meant that they were gonna use money to market and didn't see anything like that. But using a PR firm, I did was able to get podcasts, articles, interviews, different, you know, just different coverage as far as the digital world goes, the internet. Uh, my plans moving forward, I do plan to use that. Uh, also Google ads, Facebook ads, billboards, digital billboards, standing on the street corner with flyers, whatever I can do just to get, you know, a new viewer for my projects. So marketing is a big thing that I'm constantly learning about because um, I learned a lot of from marketing from 2016 when I was working on Daughter and I actually, working as, working as a producer on Daughter, I didn't want to be the producer because I just wanted to be the writer and the director and I was really invested in the project. It was about violence against women. It was an educational film, it was a community film. So I was door knocking, asking for money and asking for sponsorship and I learned a lot of I learned a lot about that side of the business and then I actually, it clicked for me years later when I was distributing and marketing my recent films that the main thing is that people need to be invested and they need to feel an emotional connection to your film. That's why Daughter was so successful for me as a writer, director and for Nexus Production Group as an educational film. So I learned later on that, you know, you need to be, they need to be emotionally invested. So. Uh, when I make my marketing campaigns, I try to have some kind of hook that make people want to watch the film. Um, it's hard because our films are all different genres. We have one about, you know, open relationships. We have one about cats. We have one about mental illness. We have daughter about violence against women and victim blaming and media perceptions. And so it's a big mix. So I'm still learning how to market, but I've been obviously listening to a lot of stuff that Jason Horton um, says, and I've tried a few of his tips as well. So I post little clips on Pinterest. Every day I'm posting on um, Incorporate, trying to keep that up. And I'm wondering now how much longer I need to do that for, because I've been doing that for about two months now. So I post little um, on Instagram. We have social accounts on everything. Instagram, we have Twitter, which I hardly use because we don't have a lot of traction there. I find Twitter is the hardest one to promote on, so I hardly post on Twitter. I've given up on Twitter. Um, so I've started Pinterest, as I said, Pinterest. Sometimes I put cats on multi clips, sometimes I put incorporate clips. I've started doing it for Friends Face and Fireworks as well, short clips. I post these sometimes on Instagram as well, sporadically, like once a week I'll do it. Um, so just a mix of different um, social platforms that I'm using. Uh, for Dace Declan, our gross out, gross out comedy has a lot of weird scenes in it, a lot of animation, so I'm trying TikTok. So not finding that very successful, a lot of people looking at it. I don't know if we're making money from TikTok, but a lot of people looking at it, but not a lot of people liking it. So various different ways. And for our new release in Corpore, we got a marketing team to um, October Coast to um, help us launch that film and we made a lot of sales in the first month because they were promoting it to a lot of different places and getting us some reviews, mixed reviews, but it was still giving us some sales. So yeah, they, they got us the Hollywood Reporter, so that was that was the biggest one. That was major, and our lead actress in Incorporate, Clara, she was getting probably like 10 or so interviews yeah, just she from had a lot. what October Coast was lining up for her. So we're very impressed. Uh, we've worked with other PR firms oh. in the past and we've never really been satisfied. And they were affordable too. And they always want your know, money up front. So you give them like, you know, okay, 5,000. I used to run a festival. So we worked with a PR firm in Australia, 5,000 up front. And all the press that she got us is, you know, the things I used to get myself in the previous years. But October Coast, um, they didn't charge anything up front. So they actually do all the work first. 
and you know, then if you're satisfied, they send you the invoice. So it was great working with Sober Curse. We highly recommend them. So it's interesting. It's bright and it's bleak all at the same time. It's bright because the the internet and technology has allowed the process to be completely democratized. I know that gets said a lot and has almost become like a cliche, but it's so true. If you know what you're doing or you can kind of figure out what you're doing or stumble through what you're doing, technology has made it possible that you don't have to rely on gatekeepers anymore. You can do everything yourself. You can be your own label. You can be your own PR. You can be your own editor. You can be your own sound designer. You can be your own sound mixer. You could do all of these things from a laptop in your basement. Your basement can become a fully functioning micro budget movie studio. The way mine is right now, this is my micro budget movie studio right here and now. At the same time, traditional means of distribution are just dying, if not dead. You have a, a beast like Amazon that opens their doors and shuts them just as quickly in, in a few years, uh, leaving everybody out in the cold. But the exciting, the exciting part of this is that because of the technology and because you can make a film for, for a very small amount of money, you can also be in, fully in control of your work. It's hard to say what the future of independent films looks like because I would say out of the blue this year, I've watched so many films that feel like independent projects. So it's hard to say. I think that with the expansion of all these streaming sites and all these different platforms splitting up and kind of more diversifying, even kind of dialing in certain parts of their platform to be specifically to movies or specifically to sports and, and those kind of things, that that opens up more content for those channels or those streaming platforms or whatever they are. And hopefully for we filmmakers, that creates a greater need for our films and especially the good ones start getting picked up by more places and shown to all these different audiences that haven't seen them. Personally, I think the future looks very bright because now there's, um, I, I would think not that long ago, someone like me could not just say, I'm gonna do a film. <laughs> so the fact that I was able to say, I'm gonna do a film and I actually did it and it's out and people are loving it. And so that speaks volumes because um, it's just about anybody. You could just say, I'm going to do a film, get your phone and start and start. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's key. Start. I'll tell you what, I am approaching 30 years doing this independent horror filmmaking stuff. And the future of independent film has always looked bright and bleak at the same time. I swear, it's just, you know, I feel like I can stay, take a little bit of a step back and and say, you know what, it's always been this way. There's, you know, people talking about how everything's falling apart now and like, oh, what are we gonna do? This this channel's going away. This, you know, way we were able to do things is not viable anymore. Uh, I I heard that from people. You know, the, the future of independent film, independent movies is falling apart, you know? I, I read those headlines 20 years ago. I feel like there's always stuff falling apart and there's always stuff being built. You know, I'm jumping back a ways, but you know, Netflix fell apart. There was, a, just like Amazon in recent years has had a couple bloodbaths where they're like, you know what, independent films, ah, we're getting rid of them. I, I had a bunch of films on Netflix. I had like six films that I had worked on on Netflix. And then one day they said, you know what, we're not doing that stuff anymore. And they got rid of it all. Uh, and people were like, oh no, what are we gonna do? Uh, Draculina Magazine, again, I'm going back a ways, but there was a time when Draculina Magazine, Scream Queens Illustrated, Alternative Cinema, there were a bunch of magazines, and each of those companies did like 10 other titles. And all those magazines, you know, the back bunch of pages were all catalogs, basically, for shot on video horror movies of, of all all types, all budget, zero to, you know, who knows what. But um, it was, and those things were sold in bookstores. And now it's like, well, we don't have any bookstores and we don't have any magazines. It's just, it changed, right? But that was a viable thing for a while. People would advertise the back of those magazines. I had Draculina distribute several of my titles early on. And then, you know, the whole publishing industry fell apart. So that went away. Um, even video stores, you know, video stores went away. There were mom and pop video stores that would buy from independent distributors. 
Uh, and then, you know, the chains came in and there was still a way to get in. I mean, there were, there were shot on video movies made by the Polonia brothers, Tim Ritter, other people who got in and, and you know, got, got into distributors with decent box art and those chains would buy those shot on video, low budget titles. Uh, and then all that went away. So those were all being destroyed. But in the meantime, you know, then Amazon rose up and that became a way to do things. You can reach this whole worldwide audience through that. Things like Tubi TV is the latest thing. I mean, that's just like a giant online video store with a zillion offerings and it's available everywhere. And there are various ways for independent people to get on that. Roku, there's tons of Roku channels, all kinds of niche channels that you can try to get into, either dealing with a, an aggregator like Film Hub or, you know, I've got deals with individual Roku channels. So there's, everything's falling apart and everything's building at the same time. So it's bleak and bright at the same time. I will say there are times when it's brighter than others. And they're, you know, it's like, here's this new thing. Everybody's going to do this. This is great, you know, fantastic. And then things fall apart and it's maybe bleak for a little while. These, these other things are kind of working, but boy, that was great, wasn't it? And then something else comes along. So I think, um, you know, for what it's worth, I think it's always kind of great and terrible at the same time. And that's just the way it always has been and probably always will be. I can tell you two things about the future of micro-budget filmmaking with absolute certainty there will be an ever-increasing amount of product entering the marketplace. And as power consolidates within the platforms, there will be increasing downward pressure on price. But as we move forward as filmmakers, we have to find a way to be cost-effective and to maximize our return on investment. And the cheaper we can make these films, the more profit we can see. I would say both. It's definitely a double-edged sword. So technology is increasing every day. There's a new camera out all the time. Um, you're able to get a quality that at this, you know, budget and this level was unheard of, you know, even five, 10, 20 years ago. You know, new lights make everything so much easier. New microphones, new cameras. The problem, I guess, with that is the marketplace has come saturated. There's an overabundance of projects out there. You know, everyone's trying to get their projects made and seen. And a lot of platforms are kind of coming to a point where they're gatekeeping. They don't, they don't allow, you know, independent filmmakers to be on their site. So filmmakers have to find a place to showcase their work. And so hopefully there'll be more filmmaking friendly platforms in the future and it won't look so bleak. I think the future of independent film looks brighter now than possibly ever because what's really been hobbled, what's really been hobbled in the pandemic era has been the big budget projects. I think what could happen in the future is that even if it's not micro budget projects, but those, those lower to mid tier budgeted films that really have kind of disappeared in the age of you know avengers five and six or whatever is you're going to start seeing as things open back up again that studios might be more inclined to actually do a 10 million dollar film um or a five million dollar film especially in the horror genre but even not necessarily exclusively to that because it if they don't have as much of a financial risk up front uh, sometimes you can get more creative freedom that way. And with the distribution platforms opening up so much through all the various digital media that there is, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge is actually finding your audience. But as far as getting something made and then putting it somewhere where people can find it, I think we're in a better position now than perhaps at any point in the history of the business. I mean, obviously, again, that, that gets affected by... Um, you know, the pandemic that's driven up production costs and, and all kinds of other different challenges, but that's not always going to be there. So looking in the, the macro, I think the, the future's, the future's great. There's nowhere else I'd want to be. So I think the future of independent film is fairly bright. Of course, there are hurdles, there are issues that you're going to face. You know, the pay is awfully low. You know, on Amazon, one cent per hour stream, that it can be even more difficult to get to Amazon with what they're doing these days, shutting down media on demand and blocking documentaries. 
But at the same time, the equipment is readily available. It's never been easier to make a film. That does mean that the market is oversaturated, so it's difficult to have your voice heard. But you can reach the whole world these days with the internet. So it's almost like the positive and negative balance each other out. So overall, with a positive attitude, and you know, with the ability to make content upon content upon content, I think the future is bright for independent film. The future of independent film is pretty interesting because there probably is less and less opportunity for making a lot of money, but it has become easier and easier to gather together gear and a small number of people and make something that's pretty competent. You can make a pretty professional looking movie for a very small amount of money, whereas that was more difficult back in the film days. The problem is now that so many people are able to do that and you have a marketplace that's so full of films. Many of them are, are quite good too. And so, um, you know, when you're browsing a VOD marketplace, you can't even pick because there are so many films to make. So how do you make something that's going to stand out? And I think the future is really going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult to compete with everything that's out in the marketplace.